hit the record button. Okay, we are recording, so let me hand the floor over to group 12. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, we're group 12. Um, our members are Davis, Gergen, Kent, and Maxwell. Um, the title of our product is the Makeup Mirror Heliostat. Next slide, please. And to, for our presentation outline, first we're going to go over the hedgehog concept. Um, and then our product overview, subsystem identification, descriptions, analyses, as well as the key features, cost breakdown, our technology readiness level, and then our summary and conclusion. So for our hedgehog concept, we can first address the three questions that we are trying to answer. So um, what are we best at? So our CAD and engineering analysis skills are very good and assist us in making um, educated decisions on design feasibility. What are we passionate about? Uh, we're passionate about providing innovative solutions to make environmentally friendly power solutions more fiscally sensible and affordable. And what drives our economic engine? So a 20% profit per module by minimizing the uh, cost per part through using OTS parts whenever possible so we can meet our consumer needs. And in summary, um, our hedgehog concept is to use our CAD and engineering analysis skills to make heel set fields more fiscally sensible and meet consumer needs by minimizing cost and maintaining quality. Next slide. So our product overview objectives are to design a small, low-cost helio set while maximizing thermal efficiency and automating safety and control. So our overall dimension for our helio set, um, we have four helio sets per module and we have 360 degrees rotation along two axes, uh, elevation and azimuthal. Um, our max size for the set is um, in meters 0 0.5 by 0 0.73 by 1.07, and our total mass is 33.6 kilograms. Next slide, please. And we have four subsystems in our heliostat. So we're starting with our foundation, um, our support, our sun tracking mechanics, and our reflective surface. <clears throat> so this is our first uh, subsystem, it's the foundation subsystem. Um, the concept we chose was essentially a concrete block with the aluminum plating and some zinc plated steels um, securing the aluminum plate to the concrete block. Um, it allows, it gives a lot of good weight and stability to the system um, and trying to maintain a low cost as well. It's very, very good for the ambient conditions in Las Vegas, Nevada. And um, it has good manufacturability, so it, it keeps the manufacturing cost low. Uh, furthermore, the uh, concrete foundation will be set into the ground some, so it will probably sit flush or just below ground level. Yeah. Uh, those screws are concrete screws. The next step system is our support. <clears throat> this kind of gave us our name. Uh, we went with a makeup mirror style. Um, the entire support system is made of either square or round aluminum tubing. Um, this gives us our corrosion resistance because of the wind and lots of sand being thrown around. Um, the main support rod uh, that runs from either side of the makeup mirror that holds up the reflective surface is also made out of aluminum. And um, we kind of blended our uh, support and sun tracking uh, subsystem, uh, which you will see into kind of one system to avoid material cost, which was nice. And um, we did some simulations, some calculations, and we were um, very safe with high factors of safety way over N equals two. Go ahead, Gergen. The sun tracking mechanics uh, involve a system of cylindrical shafts uh, in which there is a fixed shaft with a motor attached to it and a mobile shaft that rotates about its own axis. Uh, a gear is attached to the motor shaft and to the mobile shaft as well. And the mobile shaft is welded onto the bottom piece of the U-shaped support. So the rotation of the mobile shaft will provide the azimuthal rotation of the entire system, excluding the foundation, of course. And the entire gear system is placed inside a protective casing made of aluminum to prevent wear and damage due to the effects of the surroundings. And two gears are attached to a horizontal rod that attaches to the reflective surface to provide the elevation rotation. 
It is a similar system of two gears where a smaller gear is attached to the motor and uh, it drives a larger gear that is connected to the horizontal shaft. And at first we only considered using one motor since having two could result in unwanted miscellaneous stresses due to the misalignment of the motors. But the second motor would have to be replaced with the bearing to avoid friction and wear. And it turned out that using a motor was the cheaper option than involving a bearing instead. Um, moreover, a Raspberry Pi Pico was chosen as the desired micro microcontroller. It is compact, it is cheap, and its functionality is sufficient for our purposes. Um, closed loop control will be implemented since it has the ability to self-adjust. Uh, next slide, please. The reflective surface consists of two components, a mirror and a frame to support it. The mirror is made of silica glass and it has a silver coating to provide higher reflectivity of 90%. Uh, the frame is made of aluminum and it is attached adhesively to the glass and the adhesive used to attach the two components is Supreme 10 HT, which is an epoxy adhesive. It was selected because it has a very high strength, wear resistance and its maximum operating temperature is 400 Fahrenheit. Okay, so this is um, <clears throat> one of our design subsystem analyses here. This is for the foundation. Um, we did some bolt analysis. We basically wanted to avoid the bolts uh, shearing due to any um, wind-induced drag. Um, so we had a worst case scenario. I think it was in a storm in like the 90s or something was 40.2 um, meters per second was the velocity of the wind. Um, here are some assumptions. We have a coefficient of drag of 1.17. That's our uh, reflective surface area and um, the area of our bolt, the cross-sectional area of our bolt. Um, so for the, the ultimate shear strength of our bolt, which isn't a real thing you can calculate, um, there's just a uh, formula to kind of um, assume it. You take the ultimate tensile stress, stress and multiply it by 0.75, which leaves us with 315 megapascals. Um, the height of the mirror was 0.745 meters up and uh, the, the length from the central pole to each bolt was 0.15 meters. So that um, all those assumptions helps us calculate. We have our first calculation is the force due to drag, which leaves us with about 240 newtons. Um, and then we did a moment about the base, um, which was just the drag times the height of the mirror, which gives us um, 176.077 newton meters. Um, and then we wanted to find um, the force on the bolts, which was just the moment we just calculated times um, the distance from the pole to the bolt, which gave us about one kilonewton, a little bit over. Um, therefore, we divided by two for the bolts um, to, to get us down to 586. And the total shear then was just the, um, not that's, that's incorrect, sorry, the, it's not the drag force, it's the F bolt above divided by the area of the bolt, which gave us 18.574 megapascals, which is well below 315 for ultimate tensile strength. Um, the next design subsystem analysis was for support. Um, we just wanted to make sure the support beam, which was holding the whole U-shape up, would be all right. Um, again, we wanted to avoid any damage to the support beam due to any wind-induced drag. Um, some similar assumptions here, same coefficient of drag, um, height of the mirror, the, the wind, all of that is the same here. Um, and then basically we wanted the entirety of the drag force being applied as a bending stress to the support beam, so it's a worst case scenario. Um, we calculated our drag again, which is the same due to the same conditions, uh, the same moment at the base. And then this time we just compared um, the bending moment um, to get a stress and we got 45.8 megapascals, which again is lower than our ultimate tensile strength by almost a factor safety of seven nearly. Moving on to the sun tracking mechanics, we considered the shaft failure under excess shear stress. And one of the assumptions was that the shaft would fail under torsion. So we used the Tesca criterion to determine the factor of safety. Uh, under the Tesca criterion, the material will fail when the shear stress value is equal to half of the yield strength. 
and the yield strength of luminum was taken as 276 megapascals. Um, the, the shear stress is geometry dependent as well as torque dependent. The torque was taken as the maximum value provided by the motors and the geometry was taken from the CAD model. And it was found that the factor of safety was well above two, it was 396, which ensures that the shaft will not fail under stress. So when it comes to the reflective surfaces, one of the main objectives was to provide the solar concentration ratio greater than 1000 suns. And several assumptions were made. For example, the worst case scenario was considered where the optical loss is 40% or 0.4. Uh, receiver area was taken to be as one meter squared, which is something that could be adjusted. Um, and the area of the reflective surface, of each reflective surface was 0.25 meters squared. And we have 1900 heliostat modules with four heliostats in each, making it 7600 heliostats. So the solar concentration ratio was calculated as the total correct collector area divided by the receiver area and taking into account the efficiency. But this gave us a solar concentration ratio of 1140 suns, which meets the, the customer needs. Next, we considered the thermal input power provided by our heliostat field. And the goal was to provide the thermal, thermal input power of one megawatt after losses. And it was assumed that the incidence angle was optimized to have a cosine value between 0 0.9 and 1. The incidence angle is dependent on four factors, on four variables. Uh, two of them were able to control them being the slope angle and the azimuthal angle. The other Two variables are out of our control. One of them is actually constant, it depends on the latitude. And the final one is just not something we can control. And instead of trying to optimize the value and differentiate an equation with four variables, um, we just made this assumption because we can control two of the variables out of four. Um, the beam irradiance on a tilted surface depends on the direct normal irradiance, which is provided online and the incidence angle. Therefore, the thermal input power uh, can be expressed as follows. Uh, it takes into account the optical losses, which are assumed to be 40%, as in the worst case scenario. And then the cosine efficiency, again, worst case scenario is 0 0.9. And then the total collector area and the direct normal irradiance. So it was found that for the values of beam irradiance above 1,000, we 1000 watts per meter squared, the thermal input is equal to 1.03 megawatts, which again meets the customer needs. Um, we also consider the failure of the aluminum frame because it supports the mirror and the failure of the frame would result in the failure of the whole system. So we wanted to ensure that the frame wouldn't fail under bending. Several assumptions were made. Uh, first of all, the frame was modeled as a rectangular beam fixed at its center. And it was also assumed that the maximum bending stress would occur when the slope angle is zero. So when the surface is parallel to the ground, uh, flexural strength of aluminum was taken as 299 megapascals. And due to the symmetry of the system, uh, we only considered one half for simplicity of the analysis. The calculations are presented in this slide. Uh, again, stress is very geometry dependent and we considered the maximum values where the stress occurs and the worst case scenarios. And that gave us the maximum bending stress of 2.24 megapascals. So with a flexural strength of 299 megapascals, that's, this would give us a factor of safety of well above two, above 100, 133.5. So the key features of our makeup mirror heliostat has to do with the makeup mirror style design. And uh, 
first off, it is a fully aluminum construction. The being entirely made of aluminum, this heliostat has amazing strength and potential for longevity. It has a very good lifespan. Um, another plus is aluminum can easily be welded on site by a skilled welder. So the assembly time would be very short and uh, that would help bring down some welding costs in, uh, in the shop and stuff like that. Um, other than that, the, uh, the actual makeup mirror style design provides 360 degree azimuthal rotation as well as elevation rotation. The, um, what this does is it makes placement of the heliostats easier. So you don't have to be as concerned about uh, limitations of elevation angle per se. So if you were like putting it on a hill or something like that, you'd be able to compensate for the lack of, or I guess the slope of the hill, I should say. Um, other than that, this is a diagram of the azimuthal rotation. It is a pretty difficult to explain component. Um, so if there are any questions later, I will feel free to ask. Basically, you have a radial, or you have the support pole, which is the one main pole that supports the um, heliostat itself. You have a radial bushing that will be a press fit down into the support pole. Following that, sitting flush with the top of the support pole is an axial and radial bushing. These are oil light bushings, so they should provide a very low uh, coefficient of friction. Um, then this rotation shaft up here is actually welded to the bottom of the, uh, the U-shaped mirror frame. And then what that does is that slides down into the support pole here, but around it is this little gear support. It's just a little aluminum collar that welds around that as well. And then the gear actually slides onto this gear support. And then that's what the motor, which is attached to the support pole down here, it is rigidly, oh, I'm sorry. It will be rigidly welded to the support pole and it will mesh with this gear here to provide rotation. Um, in this section view, you can kind of see where all the components are. You have the support pole here labeled as F. You have the uh, radial bushing here labeled as E. It's just this little part here. Uh, you can see there's just um, clearance here, just free fit there. And then you have the axial and radial bushing here labeled as D. The support pole labeled, or the rotation shaft, I'm sorry, labeled as A. Um, this is the gear support collar B, the one seen here. You can see how it sits around the outside of the support pole. And then on sitting on top of that is the gear that provides the actual, or that will be meshed with the motor to provide rotation. So for our um, sun trucking mechanics system, we have two gears um, with a face width of three inches for the large gear and a face width of one for the smaller gear. Um, so we have a three to one gear ratio um, on those gears and they are, the smaller gear is mounted onto the uh, motor shaft and this actually slides into the aluminum frame. So um, once it's slid into the aluminum frame, it can be mounted with a simple motor, uh, with a simple bracket. Um, and it allows for just easy uh, manufacturability of the frame. Um, the mirror shaft is uh, inserted directly into the bore of the frame, as well as the large gear. Um, and it's lubricated aluminum on aluminum, which um, as, Bergen mentioned previously in the presentation, provides a lower coefficient of friction than a steel sleeve bearing. Um, and you can see on the right side with the exploded view, um, how the assembly fits together. And each end of the extruded bar is covered with a end cap so that it can protect the system from any sort of sand or rain or um, weather intrusion to the system and prevent uh, fatigue failure. Um, so the cost of the makeup mirror heliostat. The cost was broken down into materials, OTS parts, manufacturing label, manufacturing labor, assembly labor, and energy consumption. 
Um, those broke down as $373.82, $307.39, $80, and 0 for the energy consumption. And what played a part in these was the raw materials was the aluminum and the 3D printing filament and the concrete. Those were pretty much the three only raw materials. Um, OTS parts, we had motors, fasteners, and gears. And we actually have gotten rid of OTS gears in the new, in our updated cost. This is a slightly older cost. It has been updated and now sits at $668 total rather than 919. And so far that is due to custom manufacturing of gears rather than purchasing these very expensive OTS gears. Um, the manufacturing labor, that is custom gears, aluminum end caps, motor gear housing, shafts, mirror, the concrete foundation, nothing too severe. So that's why the cost of that's actually pretty low. It's all just sheet metal kind of working with and stuff. Uh, the actual on-site assembly labor was calculated using the price to hire a skilled way, sorry, a skilled welder for about two hours of work because it is not much at all to actually assemble one of these heliostats. The energy consumption, we put as zero dollars because the motors and all, they run off DC. So this will have a, um, a battery bank. Each, each heliostat or each set of modules will have to have their own battery bank that will be supplied and powered, like charged by the uh, actual power that the heliostats are providing to the central receiver and all that. Um, furthermore, the assembly, well, the assembly labor, as I mentioned, was $65 an hour for about two hours. Um, the motor gear housing assembly, just like little fasteners and stuff like that that you would do on site, I averaged that as $14 an hour just for general labor prices, you know, nothing too, too crazy. Um, energy consumption, as I mentioned, no cost. So for our technology readiness level, um, the Make It Mirror Heal stat is currently rated at a level three. Um, and level three, as you can see on the slide, is a um, based on analytical and experimental critical function and characteristic proof of concept. So we are not further up the technology readiness level due to the fact that we are not able to physically prototype a model. Um, and upon further development, um, the pro and prototyping the model, its level will uh, subsequently increase. So in summary, um, Group 12 believes that the makeup mirror heel stats should be chosen as the prototype for EML 4502. Um, this is due to its innovative design, which combines the support subsystem and the sun tracking mechanics subsystem and prototyping the system will allow for unique insight into the engineering design and prototyping process. So thank you all for attending our presentation. Um, we hope that the Makeup Mirror Heal stat opens the door to sustainable affordable power solutions, and we are happy to take any questions at this time. Thank you, guys. All right, great. Thanks for sharing your design with us. Um, let's open the floor to our panelists um, with technical questions. Yeah, so this this is Rick Miles with Northrop Grumman. I'll, I'll start off. Um, my first one is just uh, on cost because the the cost uh, seen. Uh, I've seen several different requirements. The customer need statement says a bomb does not exceed a hundred dollars. Somewhere else, I saw I think in, in the poster that it need to make sure you didn't exceed $100 per square meter. Um, can you talk to, because obviously your costs here are above that, um, can you talk, because one of the things that you state is that you met all customer requirements, but this is a customer requirement. It doesn't seem like one that you met. Yeah, currently this is, we have not met this requirement. We are working to meet the requirement to do that of looking at trying to substitute less aluminum and maybe some more plastic pieces, plastic components, maybe entirely plastic support. But 
currently we have not dove into the full calculations to be sure that that would suffice. As of right now, we still have the aluminum, but that price should drop down later. And that's kind of what we're working towards right now is just the cost down. That is our main concern pretty much at this time. So you're expecting an additive manufactured tube to be less than a like piece of stock aluminum? Uh, it more has to do with the like the gear assembly and the actual mechanic parts of the assembly that are going to be uh, additively manufactured, not necessarily like the extruded bar and the extruded tube. Yeah, pretty much How does all that show up in your materials breakdown. Um, pretty much all of the aluminum is like the support pole is just like two inch standard schedule 40 aluminum. Uh, the extrusions are all just regular. OTS, extrusion, extrusion, stuff like that. Okay. So, so I, I would just be cautious, right? And never say you meet all your customer needs if you haven't gotten there yet. It, it's better to be open and honest about wh where you're trying to get to instead of saying you've already met it. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. Okay. This is Melanie with Cummins. I have a follow-up question about the cost. Um, who is um, providing the initial cost, or incurring the initial cost of the batteries that you mentioned? Um, who is who is like providing the batteries? Is that what you said? Yeah. Who? So, is that on the customer's end? Is that part of your deliveries? Um. I'm sorry, I get, I'm not understanding the question really. Could you go back to a, a few slides where you talk about, so right here you have energy consumption at zero because of the batteries. Yes. Okay, so who is providing the batteries? You mean for the base cost, like the, the, the buying the batteries to begin with will have a base cost tied to it? Yeah, exactly. I understand, yeah. I um, think we overlooked that. I understand what you mean. Yeah, so I think we need to include the the battery cost um, to begin with with each heliostat that thus later energy consumption would become zero, but there is a base cost, if you're correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that would be part of, that is part of your package, it's not on the customer. Yeah, not on the customer side, no. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you. Sorry for misunderstanding the question first. Here, okay. <laughs> yes, this is Tom Singer from North of Grumman. Um, I, I wanted to, to, first of all, I wanted to thank you for uh, doing a structural analysis of, of parts that, that showed, you know, uh, some understanding of, of what's going on without going to a FEM. Um, I repeatedly bag on people for uh, for doing FEM when it's not necessary, and you guys totally avoided that, and I, I really appreciate it. So good job on that. Cool. Um, I, I will uh, on your the the first uh, like the fastener analysis that you were showing, um, which was yeah okay flipping back to it. Um, it looked like you were considering shear load in the fasteners, right? So you, you've got like a wind load blowing on your helostat surface, and um, it's it's gonna like have a horizontal force and so you're saying okay i've got to react that with a horizontal force at the base of the pole exactly. is that correct yeah that's correct what else is that horizontal fo force going to do to your heliostat you mean the horizontal force from the induced drag sir or yes yeah so <clears throat> at, a, at a height of uh you know three quarters of a meter right so um we have um we did some bolt analysis here this was kind of more specific to the foundation and we wanted to put all the force like uh like you're saying onto each bolt in order to see mm -hmm. how much they could truly handle individually as a bolt or even as a pair of bolts um the next slide actually is about the support so we also have induced drag this is in the worst yeah, case I'm, I'm, I'm not so, i'm not so much worried about the, the support right the support's a, a big two inch aluminum pole I yeah that'll not, be fine I'm, I'm more concerned with what's happening at the base right so you've got a lateral load at three quarters of a meter up from your base right uh and so you're gonna you're reacting a lateral load but that's not the only load that you have to react um i i i guess all i could say to that is that like in considering that it's going to stand still for its whole life and then the, the worst force is going to 
feel, I guess, would be via drag. I kind of assumed that the the load or the, the force due to the drag could be handled by the bolts and only and that was the only load they had to kind of undertake. I know there's bending moment. Yeah, and bending maybe, stress maybe, if I, maybe if I ask the question in a different way, what, what's going to happen if you took those bolts out and the wind blows? What, what would happen in the helo stat? Yeah, it falls over, it topples. It yeah, like yeah, yeah, right. So it's it's gonna it's gonna tip over, right? So so that totally. says you need to react a moment at the base of your uh, base of your pole. Oh, right? okay. And, I, I think I understand your question now. Yes, the uh, the support pole is actually welded to the plate on the bottom. That is where right. the calculation in the next slide takes place. That calculation sure. ending moment. And I went off of that, and I know that. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I get that. I, I, I guess maybe I'll just, I'll just give you the answer, right? So, um, you have to react a moment at the base of this thing where it's attached to the concrete, right? And that moment is going to be reacted by tension in your bolts, right? The, right. the lateral load in your bolt is probably going to be fairly small, and it looks like you're showing a very large factor of safety for shear here. Right. Um, but you're going to be, as you tip that thing over, you're going to be trying to, to pull these bolts out of the concrete, mm. right? In, in a vertical manner, mm -hmm. right? So that's, uh, that's another major component of, of load. And probably I, I would guess that that would be the dominant component of, uh, of load for your, for your fasteners okay. down there. I see. So, you, so you're saying to take into account basically the gripping strength of the threads to the concrete. That tension in, in the fasteners, yeah, I mean, I'm not super familiar with putting fasteners in concrete because I'm, I'm an aerospace guy, but uh, but yeah, both of those things would be I see. Uh, something I'd, I'd be concerned with. Okay. Yeah, we could do some more some further bolt analysis for sure. That's a, a good point. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Well, to answer Dr. Chesney's question, uh, we do definitely expect the cost of bulk manufacturing to bring the total cost down. The, right now, the cost analysis is for one module and not for bulk manufacturing of the entire field. Uh, for example, uh, the filament that we use for the 3D printed gears, we take into account one filament per module, but in reality, one spool of filament will be enough to produce several heliostat modules. So that will bring down the cost. Moreover, um, parts that are extruded in bulk uh, it will be cheaper to extrude in bulk, of course, and some parts could be injection molded, so one mold could produce thousands of parts, which will reduce the total cost significantly. Yeah, we're hoping can to I, do a little... Can I poke on the gears a little bit as well? Um, yeah, of course. Why, why do you think that you'll be able to custom manufacture gears uh, significantly cheaper than a shop that just makes gears would be able to do? Right? I mean, custom manufacturing is for parts that you, you know, don't look like something you buy off the shelf. And, and gears are particularly tricky, and a lot of shops just will not manufacture gears because they're not tooled to do it. Right. For one reason, this gear here, the uh, gear that actually goes on the support pole, that is one that it cannot be found OTS at all. It had to be made custom design in CAD and all of that. So there is no option. Why, why is that? Why, why aren't you able to find a off-the-shelf piece that will do that because there's not one that will fit over this um this standard sized pipe here uh, i think it's two and a uh, quarter inches i believe but there was no gear that meshed up with that well so i had to custom design that i believe it's 114 teeth to mesh with a 60 tooth that would be on the motor which the one on the motor was an ots part However, we are trying to get away from the OTS, like we mentioned, but that's just for the cost reasons, because on top of that, the elevation gears, these two here, um, they're plastic gears, but when sold on McMaster car or any other gear site that I found, they're at least like $70 a pop, which don't ask me why that a gear would ever be that much for a piece of plastic gear. I do believe they can be printed for cheaper. That's kind of the basis for why we want I encourage to you to test that out and, and see how well you can, number one, manufacture them, and number two, how, uh, how durable they are. Okay. Because I, yeah, I suspect that a company that, you know, makes gears is, is going to be better at it than, uh, than you know, your 3D print. Yeah, I mean, I mean honestly, I would hope so. But, yeah. 
guys um okay. good job working on a small team with a smaller team than than uh most most were working with but Thank i did you. have one quick question about kind of a design choice that was made one of the customer needs requested that you maximize the area of mirror in relation to kind of the dead area around the mirror when, you know, in mm -hmm. this kind of array. And my question is why you made the choice to put your supports external of the mirror rather than below the mirror to maximize the, how big you can make the mirror. I think the choice was made to prioritize the 360 degree rotation, both azimuthal and elevation rotation. Um, because having 360 degrees though? We don't need it necessarily, but that makes it easier to account for uneven surfaces or for sloped surfaces, or to reduce the tracking error because we can adjust the position at virtually any angle that we desire. I would say that could also be down to a lack of misunderstanding the customer needs in a way, because the way I understood it was that the sheer volume of components that make up the heliostat other than the mirror should be low. So that was kind of this design. It was a streamlined design and very like just kind of kept together design. So that was that was kind of the logic going into it, I believe. As, as well, I want to say... Um... We tried to do something a little bit um, different from the, like a regular heliostat because if you look up heliostat, it's a pole to the middle of the mirror, and then you have a mirror on top of it. And I guess that is the the most like the easiest way to get straight to the customer needs is to reduce the area like that, where you have basically a pole supporting and foundation and all the mechanics in it. But um, we enjoyed, and I think that's kind of why we said too that we would like, but we we could see this being prototyped because it is a heart like a little bit. Um, um, like a little bit more insight into the engineering of it instead of just going straight up with a pole to the back of the mirror. Okay, so um, yeah, no, I mean, you could still get, you know, the azimuth down, tipping without going, I, I guess I'm misunderstanding what you're saying about putting everything straight up the center of the pole. But you, know, you have this wide surface area of the mirror and these amounts could have just brought been brought down and slightly in it'd be almost the exact same design except it would be centered under the mirror and mm. you could actually place the mirrors a little closer together you get a little more uh coverage for mirror surface uh but but uh anyways good job working with a smaller team and uh thank you that's a good point though we, we i understand what you're saying to try yeah. and bring everything under the mirror so it's all minimized i understand yes thank you for that i i've that makes a lot more sense now that you said that it should be within the mirror frame. I, I understand that now. All right, so um, we've got time for maybe one more quick question uh, and then we'll have to wrap up and move on. I can ask another one. Um, I love that. Yeah, okay, uh, let's see. Um, the uh while, while we're on this slide i'll ask one specific here right uh, so you, you don't have any sort of wear surface other than your like structural components uh, yes. for rotation in your mirror shaft right is that that's correct uh, is that something that you expect to be uh you know to last the life of the heliostat um in terms of uh, so this is something that was not very considered when we, were when we were trying to minimize the cost of the heel stack, considering that our cost was already so high. Um, we were considering the lubricated like uh, aluminum on aluminum. Um, we prioritized over where we prioritize the actual mobility. Um, so as I mentioned before, the coefficient of friction between the aluminum and the aluminum um, was significantly less than the steel bearings that we were um, seeing available commercially. Um, so we prioritize that uh, uh, limiting the friction between the components more than the wear between the components themselves. Uh, okay, so a couple of things about that, right? So your, your customer is, is expecting these to last for a certain amount of time, right? So in order to show that you meet your customer needs, you've, you've got to have some way to evaluate how long uh, these are going to be able to, to rotate in there. Uh, you know, in whatever kind of lubrication you've got, uh, I'd, I'd still be concerned about, uh, you know, 
component on component wear rather than having some sort of bearing in there. Um, I'd, I'd also question whether lubricated aluminum is, is going to be a lower coefficient of friction than, uh, you know, a, an actual bearing. I, I think that's maybe an incorrect statement, but um, primarily, you know, just, just the customer needs. I mean, if you can do it and, it, you know, and it moves and, and everything lasts, and that's great, but I, I'd certainly like to see some sort of accounting for, uh, you know, what that's going to do over the life of the system. Right. Okay. And to like address the, the, the bearing statement, like um, we're talking more about sleeve bearings, um, any sort of ball bearing, um, something that actually like limits the, the contact between the two surfaces was significantly more expensive for us to input uh, into the system. Um, so well, you're already 10 times the cost, right? So what's a little bit more right. of a bearing? That's true. That's a good point. Yeah, fair enough. But yeah, I was just saying that the sleeve bearing is the bearing that I was referencing, not something like a ball bearing or. Yeah. Okay. Um, so on that note, we're um, right at 1030. We're actually a minute or two over. Um, so, so let's wrap up there. I want to thank this group for uh, going first. Um, <laughs> it's sort of a double whammy. Not only did you guys go first, but uh, like we said before, you, you've been uh, sort of at, at, half power uh, for a good part of the semester because of um, some of your colleagues dropping. So uh, we appreciate you guys um, working as hard as you did to deliver the design um, on time and for being the first ones to, to go through the, uh, the evaluation process. So thanks for that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Great. Okay, so let me uh, stop recording. <laughs>